I'm from Australia. Um, and more specifically, I'm from Canberra in Australia, which is where some other people you may know come from, which is Glenn Smith of Grail's podcast fame. Um, I've uh, created a couple of um, programs and plugins and apps that you may have heard of, and I run a company called Nerdog. Um, so, today I want to uh, introduce you to Goodform, which is a, uh, a plugin that we uh, developed out of uh, some technology that we produced for uh, the Legal Aid Commission in, uh, in Canberra. Uh, Legal Aid Commission basically does grants of, uh, of aid for people to uh, uh, basically get legal assistance, that sort of thing. Um, so, forms are hard. Uh, complex web, web forms are, are damn near impossible. Um, especially with the sort of current technologies that are around. So what do I mean by a complex web form? Well, a complex web form is a form which uh, the route through the questions is determined by the answers to some of those questions. Um, and the questions can actually be generated from those answers on the fly. Um, and uh, I've got a, a little example here oh, of one. Hopefully it'll come up. Yep, nice PDF sort of stuff. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the references here skip around in the questions. So you say here it says go to uh, go to question 18 or something like that. I can't quite see it from here. And um, you'll see here there are sections where there are multiple uh, multiple people. If you've got more people than that, you have to attach you know documents to it. Um, you've got Questions like this one, which if you start answering that and put in bits and pieces, you've got uh, extra parts of the form to fill in yet again. So, that's a, that's a complex web form. Okay, so what makes this so hard? Um, well, there's a, there's a couple of form anti-patterns with the way, the, the way that we do stuff, so I'd like to go through those quickly. Um, the first one I like to call domain orama, and that's where you've mapped your database, your, your form directly to your database. Um, so what happens is that you, you know, you take that, you use the validation, you map it to the database. Um, but complex web forms tend to have a lot of a lot of different pages and bits and pieces, so you've got a lot of mapping. Uh, you, you'll map that maybe to a, uh, a data object, which also um, has a uh, validation, that sort of stuff, but that's then mapped to the, uh, the database. Um, so <clears throat> that leads to some fairly complex schemas where you're, you're basically trying to relate data that uh, may not exist um, to other bits of data, and to pull it back out requires uh, some fairly complex uh, queries with joins and all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, the, the issue with that is that uh, when your boss comes along and says, ah, look, I'd like to make a small change to the form, um, you suddenly start breaking your schema, um, and you've got to do upgrades to your database, um, to the data. Uh, you've then got more data that may not exist because the changes uh, for the old versions of the form data are not the same as the new versions of the form data. You end up with nullable fields, and then you know, some bright spark comes up and starts uh, creating uh, basically DDL in SQL on top of your database and, you know, all is lost completely. Um, the next, next one is uh, splatter logic. So with complex web forms, there's serious amounts of um, business logic locked up in the code. And it's trapped in things like the controllers and the views and the GSPs and, and even in the widgets that you start to use on the, on the pages. And there's always a, a, a temptation to micro-optimize just that little bit on the page. So, you know, you just tweak the JavaScript here and suddenly you've got logic in your JavaScript as well as in your, your view and your GSPs and your controllers and so on. And even things like Spring Webflow um, don't really counter this trend to put the business logic into, into, the, uh, into the code. Um, and the, the big issue with that is, you know, how do you know 
uh, what you've implemented. How do you know what the, the actual business logic is? Um, how can you show it to your managers? You know, you, can you pull it out and say, here you go, that's the, that's the business logic, it's just there. How do you change it and how do you test it? So the, uh, the business logic really, really needs to be um, completely separated from the, the code which displays the forms and displays the, uh, the information that you're doing. The next one uh, I call state of flux. It's basically just about uh, how you store the state um, of the form. Now the form um, may not ever be completed and uh, you, know, you may need to have the user come back to, uh, to finish off the form. So can the user go off and, uh, and uh, go and grab their bank statements, for example, to attach to the form data and leave it for a day or so, or a week, or a year, or how long, you know, when does it time out, all those sorts of things. Um, and the, the, the data may never be complete. And basically what, we, what we've been implementing, this temporary state um, for a lot of these forms is the session, and that just doesn't cut it because when the user comes back, they've lost all of their data, or the data times out, or um, you know, basically, it's not a great user interface. And while I'm there, there's um, uh, there's another issue with state, and that is that uh, how do you implement a nice user experience with um, with temporary state, um, or even if you've got a, a database to hold that that particular state. Um, how do you go backwards and forwards through it in these complex forms where uh, you've got all of your, uh, your logic locked up in, in what's actually displayed? Uh, and the way that we do it typically is we use, um, we use wizards. So, you know, you go back one page, back another page, back another page, forward a page, forward a page. Um, and with, uh, with complex forms, so for example, an insurance document, you've started filling in some information at the beginning, you realise that what they're actually asking you for is something different, so you've got to go back and have a look to see what you said and change that answer, and then you want to go forward again. Um, and it's a very um, uh, clunky user interface. A lot of the web, uh, newer web forms that uh, I've seen coming up are a little bit better in the going back business. Um, they, they tend to have sections, and you can go back to a section. Um, but you still have to go forward one at a time, and that's because their, their logic is locked up in those individual states. Okay, and then we've got um, page proliferation, um, which is hard to say. The, um, your boss first comes to you during this, uh, this project and says, oh, look, I, I wanna, we need to put up a, a, a form. And you're thinking, oh, that's cool, you know, it's just going to be an input type text, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we're using Grail, so we'll, we'll basically do some scaffolding and a CRUD app, and, you know, it'll, it'll all just come up, up automatically for us. And then the, uh, the full scope of the project uh, gets fleshed out and um, suddenly you've got GSPs and JSPs everywhere. And you've got one for each individual form section that you want to display and, if, and there's lots of micro-optimizing there because you know, one of the uh, form elements isn't displayed if they've answered this question this way, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you, know, you might get uh, really tricky and start putting it into templates and you know, using widgets and, and even going as far as uh, Java server faces. Um, but uh, really what happens is that your boss comes back to you and says, I want to make a small change. And uh, all of a sudden you realize how unreusable all of that stuff is. And the fact of the matter is that you, you now ne need to make a, a template style change where everything's got to change along. And that makes it extremely difficult. So, uh, next one. So with Goodform, we try and um, solve all of this. And the first thing we do is that we, uh, we make sure that the, we treat the form as a, as a document. So, um, you know, when you've got that, that uh, application form for a loan in your hand, it's a document. You write the uh, information into it, in, into it um, and it's a record. You can put that uh, into a folder and you can store it away, you can pull it out, you can, um, you can uh, tender it in court if you need to. Um, so we treat uh, the, the form as a, as a document and uh, it's completely self-contained and uh, it's stored as JSON 
Um, it's not quite a schemeless document, but it is versioned and um, it's object oriented. Uh, everything that you hand that document to knows that it's got the entire bit of information. Um, and you can do things like lock it down so that um, uh, the document can't be changed after it's been submitted, for example, which may be useful. You can see that I work with uh, legal people. The second thing we do is that we, um, uh, we <coughs> treat the flow and the validation as business rules. And we, to do this, we put it in a rules engine, and that rules engine is OneRing, which is something we've also written. Um, and OneRing is a scripting rules engine service. Has anyone seen OneRing or looked at it at all? No. Um, which uh, basically speaks JSON and uh, REST and XML and SOAP, and those sorts of things. You send it a bunch of facts, it uh, does uh, some rules, and then it, um, it basically sends you back a bunch of facts with some additional information. Um, so just to give you an idea of how that works, here's a simple rule. Um, so here we've got a, a rule set called spaced, and we require a fact which is singer. Hang on, I'll see if I can point to it up there. Here we go. So we, we uh, require a fact which is singer. And here we've got a rule. So the singer is Hadfield. So when the singer is, and there's a regular expression, Hadfield, then singing equals in space. Otherwise, singing equals on Earth. And uh, one of the beauties of uh, the One Ring Rules Engine is that you can put in some tests um, and actually test your rules, which um, is extremely useful. And one ring uh, won't actually load a rule set unless all the tests pass. So the tests are actually part of the rules. When you put it into one ring, it'll test them and it'll say, hey, they don't pass, so I'm, I'm not going to load it. Um, so here you can see a test. We put in the, uh, the fact singer is Hadfield and it says singing in space. And uh, here we say singer is Bowie and it says singing on Earth. Now here's a, here's a bit more um, involved in example, which is basically how we control the flow of a form in good form. And uh, you can see up the top here, we, we're checking to see whether they've been previously represented. And you see here the, the fact, uh, now the facts are a map. So this is uh, just map references. So S1 uh, re represented before is yes, and uh, they've provided a file number and we've got the file, um, then we can do something. Now that S1 is a question reference um, that we've, we've put there. It could be a far more meaningful name than S1, for example, but uh, that's what it is here. So if, uh, if that's all true, then we, um, we set pass to true. Otherwise, we set pass to false and we say that the next questions we should ask are G3, G6, G14 and G19. And this bit down the bottom here is a, um, <clears throat> is a little nicety for the user, and it basically says, well, if, they, if we've failed and they said that they've represented them before, then put up a message saying that the, uh, the file wasn't found. Um, now, just out of interest, this file thingy here is, um, is using what we call a reference, which I'll come to a little bit later. OK, the other thing, uh, the next thing we do is we, uh, we define the uh, form in terms of questions using a, uh, a reasonably nice little DSL that's um, pretty much easily understood by anybody who's, um, uh, who's you know, capable of reading, so your manager, that sort of thing. So um, I'll just give you an example of that. Here we go. The, um, so basically, we define a form. We've got a couple of questions inside this form. There's that question reference. Technically, you don't really need the, um, the brackets around there, but it's, uh, it's easier than forgetting the comma. And um, then we basically have a set of questions in here. So this is the first question, what is your name? Um, and we assign that to a group called names, and that's a group of form elements, which are in there, or, or sub-questions, if you like. And in there, we've got title, text is 10. Uh, and that le that's the length of the text, 10. We, uh, we also provide a hint, and we hear, say, there might be a suggestion, um, and we map it to a thing called title. Um, we've got given names, last names, so they're, both, they're all text. You can see here these have been marked as being required. 
Um, and then we've got uh, another question here. Have you been known by any other names? And this is just a Boolean tick, tick box. Um, and then we've got this thing here, which is called list of. And this is a list of aliases. A uh, list of element uh, basically takes that sub form, which is this bit here, um, and it'll repeat it as many times as the user wishes. So there's a add another uh, alias button, which goes on there. Uh, and that's, that's one question. And then there's the next question here, which is, what is your favorite color? Uh, and it does a suggestion of colors. OK. To, uh, to put this all together, um, we have a thing called the good form engine, which, which is the, the guts of good form. Uh, basically, it's a controller and a view. Um, and, uh, and the view is helped by a, a tag lib. So the controller basically controls the life cycle of the, of the form, and the view obviously controls how it looks. Um, now, the good thing about that is that the view keeps the consistency across the entire form and, uh, and looks after it. But to be a, um, a really useful engine, as the FAT controller would say, um, we add some extra services uh, which help you to customize um, how uh, good form works and to provide extra little bits and pieces. So here is the, um, the good form engine. Uh, now we've talked about the um, we've talked about the rules engine up here. So you basically supply some rules which go into the uh, rules engine, uh, the specification for the form or the uh, form definition as we call it, and that gets processed. There's the controller. There's the view. Uh, goes to the browser. You'll see up the top here, we've also got a little bit of uh, uh, storage, and that basically stores the form instances as well as the form definitions and their versions. Um, and then just over here uh, on the left is a thing called the reference service. Um, now, the reference service basically allows you to mark a field as being a reference to something. So it might be uh, a customer's um, customer number, that sort of thing. Uh, and the reference service will go off and, and talk to some other service somewhere and provide some information which goes back into the form document. Um, and the beauty of that is that it can be sent then off to the rules engine and the rules engine can check it. So we saw that uh, rule before where it was checking file um, and basically that's what it's done. It's gone off to the, the reference service to get the file. And then uh, the other bit we've got is the field validation service. So we provide quite a few um, form validations in, internally, so field validations internally. Um, but you can define your own uh, custom field validations for whatever it might be. Uh, a good example is uh, local phone numbers or um, uh, postcodes, etc., uh, which could be quite useful. So while we're talking about validation, um, just to, to make this clear, there's two different types of validation that we, uh, we implement. One's field validation, which is basically checking to see that the data is of the right type and whether or not it exceeds a maximum and a minimum, um, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, and the second one there is uh, data validation. And that's basically whole form style validation. So between each step, uh, we send all of the form information off to the rules engine. Um, and the rules engine can then access any of the data which, uh, which has been entered in the form previously. And you can do some very complex checks on that. So you can, you can actually cross-reference information uh, in the rules engine and make sure that uh, you know, they've said they've, they're in this uh, particular suburb, um, but they've got a property which is you know, 300 uh, kilometers away. And uh, basically, uh, you can do your own business rules around that. OK. So um, when developing forms, what happens is that uh, we spend so much time trying to get the mechanics right um, that the usability side goes down. Now, that's being addressed a little bit more these days, which is really important. But uh, we decided we wanted to make um, uh, usability a priority, because um, hopefully we can. So one of, the, um, one of the first things we did is to um, is to try and uh, uh, lay out the forms properly. 
um, and make the, the usability right. So we follow uh, pretty much all the accepted usability guidelines. Now, by accepted, if you've read um, UX Stack Exchange and all the uh, answers in the comments on those things, uh, and you've read the, uh, the white papers and the documents about you know, what is the best practice for um, laying out a form, um, there is no consensus. Um, you know, it's, it's actually quite hard. Uh, so what we've done is we've, we've done our best effort, um, what, we, what we, uh, we think is the majority view, um, and you can get in there and change it. It's all controllable by CSS. Um, that's what CSS is for. So go in and change it, uh, lay it out. There's no tables involved, so uh, you can do whatever you like. The next thing we do is we show uh, people the entire form. So once you've answered something, um, that form section moves down, uh, and the next form section is above. People can scroll down through there at will and check to see what their answers were and, and have a look at all the other bits and pieces. It also means that they can then click on that and edit it, uh, which is a really nice interface for um, going backwards and forwards through your form. So on that one, um, we can go back and change an answer, uh, but we want to save your, your place. So if you've answered all of these questions, you don't need to go through them again. When you hit next or continue, the system should figure it out for you and say, well, the next question you need to answer is this one. And it might be in between where you are up to uh, and, and where you've just changed the, uh, the answer. And it may just be a single question inside a form, so it'll just go back to that, that question and ask you that one. Then when you hit continue, if you've answered all the questions up to where you were up to, it'll take you all the way back to there. And uh, of course, we do that using magic and uh, it, it just works. Um, actually, the, the reason why we can do that is that um, we are using the rules engine, and the rules engine comes back and it says, um, I, I want you to display these questions next. Uh, we've got the entire form document there, and we know which questions we've asked. So we'll check those questions against what has been asked, and if they've been asked, we'll send it back to the rules engine again, and the rules engine will check to see what needs to be asked next. It'll send back a next set of questions. Um, we check those again against what, what's already been answered. And then uh, rinse, repeat. You just continue that on. Once it gets to one where it says, OK, we've answered that one, that one, that Oh, we haven't answered that one. Um, it displays that particular question and goes on from there. OK, so what's it like then? Question. Yeah. Yes, it does. So basically what happens is that it looks for the next set of questions, and if you haven't answered them, um, it'll, it'll ask you those questions. Um, so if it's a different path, uh, basically you'll just start being asked uh, different questions, and it'll take you through the form that way. It will... Um, it will actually remember the answers that you have given already until the end of the form. So it basically, that's to prevent it from forgetting stuff just because you changed an answer and you may have made a mistake changing that answer. Um, okay, so let's have a look at it. Okay, can we see that? Uh, clear enough? Okay. So I'm just going to uh, create a new job application form here. I'll just show you what it's like. Um, so I can't see this on my screen, so I have to try and kind of turn around and, and hope for the best. So here we can see a little bit of auto completion happening in there. And Peter, McNeil, date of birth, whatever. Something. I'm not that young. Um, and here you can see, have you been known by any other name? So this is this is uh, basically the same as that form that we saw before. So if I click on that, it'll open up a, a section here which says, 
please put in your name and uh, I can go Clark Kent and I can do an auto complete there and then I can add another one um, or I can remove it and uh, here I can go uh, 32 Fred Street Fredville and we'll put in a postcode of some sort um, phone numbers here we can have some education um, let's try that let me say we did that completed it when I was born that'll do um, so if we hit next now you'll see it's, it's come up with a uh, thing up the top there to tell us that there's something wrong and if we scroll down here you can see what's wrong put your mouse over it it says that's bigger than 10 uh, which means that we accidentally press 32 instead of 3 and we can continue on so now we're on to the next uh, next section of the form and if we just uh, scroll down here you can see the previous section of the form um, and I can have a look at that and go oh I forgot to enter in my high school details so we'll just do that and just to make it easy and actually we do have another name so let's fill that in yeah Sorry, say again. Sorry, I, I can barely hear you. I'm deaf as a post, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, right. Um, if, um, if you put in 2000 in this particular case, it won't do anything because I don't have a check. Um, but um, it'll, it'll basically, you can check to see that it's, it's got a minimum date and a maximum date, those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, it, it, you can certainly do that. So uh, let's say that that's my stage name. And we'll go next, down here. So you can see we've just changed that. We've got um, the extra name in there. And we can put in some other info. Ref23, yeah, that'll do. Nerdog. Um, and I'm not going to attach a resume just yet. Um, these are required fields. I'm sure you know how they work, so. Uh, Fred Smith. Yeah, got a contact number. Okay, so we're going to hit next here. Um, now, each time you hit next, it goes off to the, the rules engine and checks, to, checks the data um, to see whether it's okay. Now, one of the things you can do with that, um, there's, a, there's a final rule that you, uh, you write, which is um, to check to see that the form is complete in the sense that you want it to be complete. Um, so once we've gotten to the end of the form, it'll go back to the rules engine to just double check the form. And that can be really useful when you, um, when you want people to be able to complete pretty much the whole form without having to attach things they don't have at the moment. Um, and they can come back to it and attach those things later. And so here you can see up the top there, you still need to provide your resume. Um, and uh, one of the things we do there is we uh, enable uh, people to print that out and uh, we email it to them so that they've got uh, a piece of paper to say that they, they've got to um, uh, get this extra information. Um, when they do come back, uh, all you need to do is click on that link and it takes you to the, to the thing and we can attach our canteen price list as our resume and off we go. And so now we can submit the form. So that is a, um, a hook there, basically it's a placeholder. That's where you process it. So that's when the users supplied all of the information that you want. 
um, and we send it, we give it to uh, you guys. Basically, you do your processing of the form data and, um, and check to see how that, that works for you. So what we might just do, oh, that's not full screen, is it? OK, so just to give you an idea, a quick idea of what the form data looks like, you can see here that it's just JSON. Um, so that form data is stored in, our, in the database. Um, you can take that data, for example, and shove it in a MongoDB database, and you can query it to your heart's content um, and use it for doing data mining, those sorts of things. So if you've just got a, a form or a set of forms which are required for collecting data for, uh, for a particular process that people do, you can do that and just put it into a MongoDB database and then data mine it later. Um, or else you can, you can take it out as a map, so um, basically the, the information is provided as a, as a map, and you can process the fields as you like. Um, so that's basically it. You can see all that information there. You can see where, we've did, where we did uh, the aliases, which are a list of. They're literally a list. So we've got Clark Kent and uh, Chuck Berry there. So just uh, quickly look at the, the form definition that we were just using then, uh, and that's this one here. Can everyone see that? Do you need it bigger? Oh, OK. Um, so basically, that's, uh, that's the form definition there. In this particular case, we've just um, generated that in, um, uh, in the, the bootstrap, and we we call the form um, with form data service there uh, to create a new form uh, version. Um, you can call that from anywhere. You can generate it however you like. Um, you can put the information directly into the database programmatically. You can you know, load it out of a file, any of those sorts of things. Um, OK, and just have a quick look at the rules which we used there. And you can see this is the, the rule set we used. So basically, the way it works is that you ask uh, the rules engine what the first questions are that uh, need to be asked. You can hand it in some uh, preliminary information in the, in the fact map. That information might be, for example, the uh, user's login name and their roles, those sorts of things. Um, so uh, it basically pre-information pre to go into there. And the next bit is um, is basically the first set of questions that get asked after, um, after the first form is um, submitted. And here you can see we've, we've basically said when true, these are the next questions we're going to ask, um, and so on. Now, if we go back up here to the form administration, uh, here you can see the, the form definition, um, and we've got two different forms we've got defined here. And you can, in fact, uh, edit that. That's a really simple little interface. It's, uh, it's not meant really for production, but it gives you an idea of how to, how to do those, those particular things. Um, we can do a new version here. And let's see whether or not I can type backwards. Uh, where are we? Question. Color. is your fave colour. He says, did I use double quotes or single quotes there? Double. OK, and um, that's going to be text. And it's going to be 20 characters long. And it's going to map to What have I written? Yeah, go. Cool. Yep, looks good. And close our brace. Cool. Okay. So we're just going to save that. Now it won't show up um, on our form when we do our new form because we haven't included it in the rules from the rules engine. So um, what we're going to do just here, oh, 
This is the first page of questions, and we might just shove it right up the front. Colour. Um, and we'll save that. And just go back up to here. And if I can find one ring, there it is. Rules. Update the rules. Look at that, it didn't fail. That's good. Oops. Go back to this one. Go to our job applications. Oh, you can see that the, uh, the previous job application is sitting there. So it's already been finished, so it's not going to change. And you can see here what is your favorite color is up the top. Um, and we can basically just uh, continue to run that. So you can see here, just, just by changing the rules and just doing a, a simple insert, we've got an extra question in there. Um, that information gets put into the data map, and off we go. Now, if I start typing in uh, pink, you'll see that it's, it doesn't do anything um, terribly much. But if we, if we go back to our form administration, and we say we want a new version of that, and at the end of that, we go suggest color. There. And we go save. And let's get a new job application. And because this is a new version, you see version 3 sitting up there. And now I start typing in pink. It's doing a suggestion for us. Yeah? Sorry, say again. Can you? Can we have a select box where the data is from a database table and that we put it for, to the user? Um, for example, countries, for example, uh, uh, any, any kind of data. Yeah, at the moment we haven't, the, it's, it's one of the, the few things we didn't implement was a, a select box. Um, and that's because we've, uh, we're trying to go for the uh, lowest common denominator of things which can be displayed. Now, of course, a select would work, um, but uh, we may well, you know, add that in uh, because I've seen a lot of a lot of places that want to use that so as data. So, does that answer your question? So it's not available right now. Sorry. So it's not uh, available right now. No, it's not available right now. Oh, okay. No. Feel free. Uh, this is an open source project. Um, feel feel free to be the change that you seek. Um, you know, we'd, <laughs> we'd like to see some uh, contributions to it. So, yeah. Any other questions there? No. Nope. Um, okay, so basically that's using uh, the Simple Suggestions plugin, which is um, uh, another plugin that we've, we've put up uh, to do that sort of stuff. So let's just go and have a look here at the lot. So basically you can go back and have a look at these forms at any stage and go and edit them. Um, we haven't set this form as being read-only yet, so you can still edit that particular old form there. Okay. So we're just going to create uh, a form with the lot. So here are basically all the, all the bits and pieces that we've, um, we've created, all the different types of form elements. So you've got text, you've got uh, text that's longer than 100 characters long turns into a uh, text area automatically. Um, you've got numbers by range, so this is a percentage and it's got a range of 0 to 100, so if you put in more than 100 there it'll complain. Um, you've got numbers by length, so here it's basically said that this, this is a number and it can be uh, five digits long, uh, and the digits include the dots, so it's a very simple um, sort of way of working with it. Phone numbers, money, uh, money automatically in, inserts a, uh, a money character in, in front of it. Um, you've got date objects which link up to the, the jQuery UI. Um, you've got date time objects, so we can do this. Um, I can start typing in 10 and it'll, it'll start doing the bits and pieces for me. I can say 10 a.m. and um, if you do column zero, 00, it all just works. Um, in fact, I think you can install another um, jQuery plugin so that you can use your mouse to scroll through those. Um, you've got attachments. And we'll just attach it an attachment. 
you've got um, you know, pick one of these, and in fact you can do a pick one and add an extra bit of a question to that. Um, sorry, the shade is brown. Um, and you can do the same with uh, multi-selects, um, and keep those like that. You can have a very simple question, so this is a very simple question with a, uh, a preview. You can have more, so you basically click on that and you get more bits and pieces. So you can say I want soap and bread and um, uh, jam. And um, <clears throat> you can dynamically uh, repeat questions. So uh, basically here what happens is that we've told it what, um, what lollies there are and it's generated a single question for each lolly. That can be done on the fly, so your rules engine might um, grab some information, so uh, you know a list of people, for example, and it'll automatically generate a number of questions based on that. Um, so here we go. We might have uh, nine for toffee, one for gum, and um, twenty for apples. Um, and you've got the list of things which, um, you know, I love your nose and uh, you know, I love it 20% and um, I love your eyes and you know, 98%, that sort of thing. And here we go, we've got an error. And I know what the error is, and that's a bug which I've just fixed. So the bug is that uh, although the error is there, it's not showing up on the screen. OK, so uh, let's have a quick squeeze at that, if we can see that. Um, this is actually all on our, um, our documentation website. Um, but. The, the lot form basically gives you pretty much all of the different options that are available. Can you guys see that? Is it big enough? Um, so you'll see things like preamble, and that puts um, information bit just before the question. Um, and then required, and then you've got the default values, you've got maximums and minimums, that sort of thing. So number by range is really nice. Um, so basically you say that the number and it's between 0 and 100 and, and that sets your maximum and minimums. It sets the size of the, uh, the field um, and those sorts of things. You can set units in there, so we set it as a percentage and you can put some defaults, etc. cetera. Um, now I said that's in our documentation. So here we go. Um, on the Nerdog website um, you can go to the good form documentation and here's the DSL documentation um, and that shows you how the how the form elements work and down the bottom that's the entire uh, the lot one as well which is a good example to start off with um, on the github site um, you'll see a tutorial which is there I'm on Wi-Fi so it may not work um, and you can follow that tutorial pretty much to, to go through there. There's uh, one ring install information. One ring's pretty, pretty easy to install. It's just a, a straight web app, um, and we provide you with a, uh, a zipped version of it, just here, with Tomcat, um, pretty much already set up. Um, it should start up on port 7070, so you can, you can access that um, to get started. And um, just quickly, uh, as I said, this is developed um, in conjunction with um, uh, the Legal Aid Commission and the ACT. Um, and it's been used in production there now for uh, almost six months uh, and has been working quite well for that. Um, they, uh, they, they graciously let us um, split that off into an open source project, which is uh, where good form comes from. And I don't think that the Wi-Fi is going to let me through, so... Yeah. All right. Sorry? 
Uh, yeah, I'd have to get something out of my bag, and I don't think we had enough time. Um, any uh, any questions on that stuff? Yeah. Does, does uh, Bitforms need to integrate with localization? Yes, it does. Um, so it's um, it's. Let me go and have a look down here. You've got um, a series of you've got the messages as you would expect. Hang on. Where are we? Uh, yeah. Anyway, you've got um, you've got messages which you can change, which is basically for all of the uh, standard text that we use. And as far as uh, the forms are concerned, because we use mapping to um, to data, um, which means that if we click on this bit here, you'll see here we've we've mapped the information to um, date. So here it's a number range, et cetera, et cetera. Um, basically, you create two different forms uh, for each language where you can change the questions completely, um, but you map it to the same data. And so you can take that map and uh, mine it in exactly the same way as you would um, whatever the language happened to be. Um, and in fact, in the... Um, uh, in the, the, the legal aid site, uh, we have a question up the front, which is, do you need an interpreter and what language do you speak? Um, so basically, you create two different form definitions, one with uh, one language, one with the other language, um, and you pull up whichever form definition you need based on the language that they choose. Does that make sense? It, it could possibly be done better. Um, we've been uh, actually chewing over different ways of handling it. Um, but uh, it's, it seems that using the form DSL is the clearest way of doing it um, so far because you then get a readable document which is all in one language, for example, uh, instead of having you know, a code reference to some other uh, place which you have to then go and look up and see what the question happens to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, sorry, I didn't get the last bit. What did you say? What would be the elevator pitch? Oh, okay. For why do you use um, one ring? Um, it's cool. <laughs> um, you can do a, you can do a lot of stuff in one ring, and it's not compiled. It's dynamic. Um, so uh, what happens is, is you can you you work with it by uh, taking your um, your rule set files, if you like. Um, and you edit those in your um, your IDE in the standard way. They're actually standard uh, groovy, so you can you can do that in your IDE. Um, you then would, uh, for example, push it up to uh, GitHub or to some um, repository, and then pull it down to uh, your production or your test rules engines. Um, and then when you pull it down, you then up can update the uh, the rules dynamically. Um, running as a service, uh, which drools doesn't do out of the box. Um, you can use it with multiple applications. Uh, not only can you use it with multiple applications, you can actually spread it out and uh, uh, basically scale up uh, the number of instances that you have because it's basically completely stateless. Um, and uh, it, it gives you uh, a lot of dynamic capabilities which these sorts of applications require. Uh, we looked uh, initially at building the rules engine into, um, into good form, um, but we use the rules engine for other things in our applications. Um, and so it just made a lot of sense to, to, to pull that out. Um, we also looked at drools initially um, as a way of doing it, but um, the, the way of working with uh, rules and updating the rules didn't fit um, the, the patterns that we, we were seeing. So it's more of a development process. Yeah. And the testing. The testing is actually really important. Is that longer than 30 seconds? Yeah. yeah. What about the multi tenancy? Can one ring use several multiple tenants using the same rule engine? Yes. Yes. 
Yep, you can. Um, so it goes both ways. Yeah, you can have um, multiple applications using a single um, rules engine and and pass things out. Uh, one of the things which we're, is in the roadmap for One Ring is to um, uh, have pluggable services um, to to go into that particular engine, so that, um, uh, for example, looking up um, uh, people's addresses is a non-trivial uh, thing to do, and you wouldn't pro you wouldn't want to program that into a rule. Um, what you would want to do is have your rule set be able to go and check addresses. So it says here, these are the fields which are my addresses, and check to see that that makes sense. And you might send it off to Google, for example. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? OK. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Peter. We have a break for coffee until 11 when we continue here with GroovySurf and a plug-in for Grails. Thank you.